Okay, the first thing I want to mention is that the questions will be split onto separate slides. So these are all the questions we're going to look at in this one, but I will split them up for us. Um, okay, so let's, let's just go back. So those are the four questions we're going to look at. Let's begin. A minibus taxi, taxi traveling south at a velocity of 20 meters per second collides head on with a car of a total mass 1248 kilograms, which includes the driver heading north with a velocity of 15 meters per second. Okay, so we can see what's happening here. We've got a vehicle, a taxi traveling at 20 meters per second that is gonna collide with a car traveling at 15 meters per second to this direction, and they're gonna obviously collide. So the first question says, state the principle of conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so before we get to that, we know that in these kinds of questions, we're often going to use this formula here, where you've got m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial equals to m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. We know that formula, right? But what is that formula? Well, what we are saying is that the momentum, remember that's momentum, momentum is mv. So we are saying that the sum of the momentum initial is the same equals the sum of the momentum afterwards. So what we are saying is that when objects collide like this, the momentum of the system before is the same as the momentum of the system afterwards. Okay, yes, the, the objects are gonna maybe speed up or slow down, but the total momentum of the system before they collide is gonna be the same as the total momentum of the system after they collide. So what we say is that the linear momentum is conserved. It doesn't disappear, it doesn't become more, it doesn't become less, it is the same. And that is what this is. So let's go get the proper definition now, okay? So here's the definition. It says that the total linear momentum of an isolated system remains constant. And that's pretty much what you need to say. And then in brackets here, they're just saying is conserved in both magnitude and direction. Then in 2025, which is when I'm recording this, the department no longer wants us to be using the word closed. We used to sometimes use the word closed over here. Instead of using the word isolated, we would use, use the word closed, but now they want us to rather just use the word isolated. Okay, so the main thing I want you to know is that when there is a collision that takes place, the total momentum of the whole system before is gonna be equal to the total momentum of the whole system after the crash. Now moving on to this question, it says the driver of the car claims that the taxi was not only speeding, but it was overloaded with passengers. Consider the information below. The mass of an empty taxi is supposed to be 2000 kilograms and the average mass of a person is 70 kilos or kilograms. The maximum occupancy is 12 people, including the driver. Oh, this is a cool question. We're gonna have to do an investigation to see and predict were there maybe more than 12 people in this taxi? So to, it says that use the principle of conservation of momentum to determine how many passengers exceeded the legal limit for the taxi. That's so cool. Assume all passengers are of average mass. Okay, so what we can do then is we can just go M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial equals to M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. Now we know that after the collision, the vehicles move together. So if you want to combine these two together, you can. Some learners like to do that. You can write it as M1 plus M2, and then in brackets, you can just say V final. That's okay. Um, we You can do it that way. I'm just gonna keep it separate. But I know that the velocity final of the taxi is gonna be the same as the velocity final of the car. And so I'm rather just gonna call it V final and v final because these two velocities are going to be the same because when two objects come together and they uh, they move together then they have the same velocity so their final velocities are both going to be the same so instead of having two unknowns we now only have the one unknown okay um right although this was never an unknown because they've given us the velocity anyways let's move on so 
the mass of the taxi, we don't know. So let's just go call it M1. We don't know what its mass is, okay? But we do know that, and oh, and let's say, um, let's say south is positive. So south is positive. So we know that the taxi was originally traveling south. So let's put its velocity as 20 over there. Now we know that the, t the car has a total mass of one, two, four, eight. That includes the driver and its velocity will be negative 15 because it's going 15 in a north direction. Okay. Now we don't know what the mass of the taxi is in the second part of the question either, but we know that the final velocity is 10 and it's south. So we can keep that as a positive. And then the mass of the car, that's still gonna be 1,248 and its velocity will also be 10 because it's moving with the taxi after the collision. So what we can see is that the only unknown is the mass of the taxi. And so what we can do now is just go simplify a little bit. So 20 M1, then this is gonna become a negative, 1,248 times 15, 18,720 equals to 10 M1 plus one, two, one, two, four, eight, zero. Okay, now I'm gonna bring this over to this side. So we're gonna end up with 20 minus 10, which is just gonna be 10. And then I'm gonna take the 18,720 over to the other side. And that's gonna give us 31,200. Then to get M1 alone, we're gonna divide by 10 and we're gonna get 3,120 kilograms. Now, we haven't finished that question. So we know that the this is the mass of the taxi with all of its passengers. So we know that the mass of the taxi itself without the passengers is 2,000 kilograms. So I'm gonna say 3,120 minus 2,000 is gonna give us 1,120 kilograms. So that is just the passengers, 1,120. I'm then gonna divide 1,120 by 70 to try get an idea of how many people are, are there are. And that is 16 people, Woo 16 people. And so the maximum legal occupancy is only supposed to be 12 people. So it says use the principle to determine how many passengers exceeded the legal limit. Well, there are four people who exceeded the legal limit because 16 is, um, 16 is four more than 12. So it says determine how many passengers exceeded the legal limit. So four passengers exceeded the legal limit. Next question says, do the necessary calculations to show that the collision is inelastic. Okay, so let me quickly give you a quick summary of this again. Remember that when we look at inelastic and elastic, all we do is the following is, um, first step is calculate total kinetic energy before, and then calculate the total kinetic energy after, okay? Then if the kinetic energy before, so the initial, is the same as the final, then we call it elastic. If they are not the same, if they are not the same, then we call it inelastic. Okay, so remember that kinetic energy is half mv squared. So let's go work out the total kinetic energy of the system before the crash. And let's choose um, south as positive again, south as positive. Okay, so it's gonna be a half. Now the mass of the taxi is 3120. The velocity of that taxi was 20. Now the vehicle or the car has a mass of 1248 and it was 15. Oh, but I'm gonna say minus 15. It doesn't change the answer because it's gonna be squared anyways. But um, yeah, we chose south as positive. Now, if you go calculate all of this, you get 764,400 joules. Now we're just gonna go work out the total kinetic energy of the system afterwards. So that's gonna be um, a half times the, now you could combine the masses together if you want, um, or you can keep it separate. It's up to you, okay guys, it's up to you how you wanna do that part. Now, 
I'm going to keep it separate, doesn't really matter. We know that both vehicles move at 10 afterwards. And if we go work this out, we get 218400 joules. So therefore, we can say that the initial is not the same as the final. And therefore, it is an inelastic collision. And then this last one says, Modern cars have seat belts, airbags, and crumple zones to help minimi minimize minimies. <laughs> remember monomies? You guys probably still use monomies. Well, not really in high school, but I remember in primary school we used monomies. Anyways, um, help minimize injuries during accidents. Some of you might wonder what's a crumple zone. The crumple zone is just this part in the front of the ear. Um, that part breaks very easily in modern cars, whereas the cars from like the 1950s, those cars were made of like steel, I swear. So when they were in involved in accidents, um, there was less crumpling that took place. But what that actually causes, the crumpling actually helps. The crumpling helps to absorb the impact of the, the crash and it helps the time over which the crash takes place to increase. And that lowers the impulse and the forces that all the people in the car will experience. Okay, so crumple zones are actually very good things. You want the car to break because then it absorbs a lot of the impact of the accident. Okay, and then they're also talking about seat belts and airbags, nice. Um, it says, use principles in physics to explain how the airbags and the crumple zones mentioned above contribute to the safety of passengers. Right. So if we look in our formula sheet, we've got this formula over here. Now, if you want to look at the net forces, for example, that would be acting on a human in a crash, we can see that it's got to do with the change in the momentum and the divided by the time. So the idea of these things like seat belts, airbags, crumple zones, they are all there to try and change the time and make it larger. They want the time that the person changes its momentum to increase, okay? Think about it. If this person, this person doesn't have an airbag, let's say this person doesn't have, does not have an airbag and this person does have an airbag, okay? this person's head is going to reach a velocity of zero very quickly. As soon as the car accident happens, they're going to go from like 100 kilometers an hour to zero very quickly. Whereas this person's head is going to go from 100 kilometers per hour, it's going to hit into the airbag, and the airbag is going to slow the head down, and then it's eventually going to become zero. So the time over which the collision happens is going to be much larger for the person who has an airbag. Okay, so if you can make this denominator larger, what does it do to this? Well, remember that when you are dividing with a big number, then you are going to cause this one to become smaller. And that is a good thing. You want the net force that experience that each person experiences to be as low as possible, right? So that is what these technologies are there for. They are there to increase the time of the collision. Okay. So there's no exact way to answer this, but the things you want to mention is that um, you could actually just write out this formula and then you could say that delta P is a constant in a collision. Because what is delta P? Well, delta P is the mass times final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity. So the masses of the people and the cars, that doesn't change. And the final velocity and the initial velocity doesn't change. This guy and this guy have the same initial velocity, and this guy and this guy are also going to have a final velocity that is going to be zero after the collision, or, or not necessarily zero, but they're going to have the same final velocities, and they're going to have the same initial velocities. So this part here is a constant during a collision, okay? But this part here, we can change that. So these technologies allow us, uh, so we can say that delta T can be increased by using seat bolts. Um, what did they say? Oh, oh, airbags and crumple zones, my bad. Let's just say um, airbags and crumple zones. So if you, make this, if you make this larger, then that means therefore F net will decrease. 
and so less force will be exerted on the passengers of the vehicle.